We are recording now. Great. Okay. So welcome, Andres. Uh, I'm super, super happy that we finally have the chance to have you at a Foresight Salon. Um, I think, uh, you know, it was a long one coming and we've been like ruminating on it for a long, long time. So I'm really happy that, uh, that it finally happened. Uh, so thanks so much for joining. I think the last time Hello. Hello. You dropped out for about 30 seconds. Allison, start over. We can't hear you, Allison. Okay. Just signed out. It says, Andres, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. We'll do so. Hey, hi, all. Uh, yeah. Creon, Gail, uh, Christine, Ben. Uh, yeah. Good to, good to see you all uh, <laughs> from our yeah, corresponding uh, yeah, places of hideout. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, start the presentation and uh, please uh, let me know if you can't can't to see it uh, uh it's the first time i use this this feature i think so all right so i think i'm sharing it now and uh, i'm gonna start it uh can you guys uh, see my screen all right yes we can oh perfect fantastic okay so yeah this is a um presentation about um phenomenal time and uh of course there's definitely a pun to be made in here which is that we're all hopefully going to have a phenomenal time <laughs> watching it. Um, but yeah, phenomenal time refers to basically the experience of time as opposed to physical time. So, and I think that's a kind of, yeah, the, the first distinction to be made that, uh, you know, physical time uh, has been revised very heavily, definitely in the last century um, and a little bit to this century in terms of it being understood as they're not having a universal frame of reference. And of course, you know, if you move very fast or you approach very gravitational heavy um, planets or, or, or bodies in, in the cosmos, you know, time and space will be distorted and so on. So in a sense, we, we have gone through a revolution of understanding different possibilities for physical time. And, you know, in, in a black hole, you get a super exotic physical time. Um, but uh, the thing that I wanna basically bring up today is that just as uh, we used to think there was a universal way of having physical time, and now there's a whole kind of a exotic cornucopia of possibilities. Likewise, for the experience of time, I'm gonna argue that indeed there is a wide range of possible exotic phenomenal times that go way beyond kind of the, the typical set that people can uh, think of um, for the most part. Um, and to kind of like introduce the topic, I think it's important to uh, kind of bring up uh, the idea that uh, physical time itself uh, nowadays is understood as possibly emergent on something more fundamental. Uh, there's like kind of talks, uh, for example, um, the quantum graph uh, that underlies, you know, the, the vacuum of space. And in a sense, that is like the actual way in which the graph is arranged that gives rise to three uh, dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And, you know, in the exotic other universes, if the underlying quantum graph was interweaved in a different way, then there might be different, you know, macroscopic uh, time and space, and it could be pretty wild, pretty different than how it is in this universe. Um, and in, in that sense, you can also think of, of the notion that, hey, like time looks kind of this very continuous and smooth thing on our scale and the scale of uh, humans and animals and even you know viruses and so on but if you zoom deep enough you will eventually come to see that uh kind of it stops being this smooth um you know kind of uh universal universally advancing uh property and it's more kind of this 
very deep down this patchwork of different graphs interacting with each other that on the whole, they create this microscopic, you know, general direction of time. Um, and uh, for, for ex the experience of time, I will argue that it, there's something like that going on. Now, to kind of like go um, very deep and, and, and deeply understand uh, what I mean by all of these, uh, we will need, in a sense, to um, be able to break down uh, the assumptions needed to understand the experience of time. And I'm basically going to walk you through uh, the three core assumptions. Uh, the first one is indirect realism uh, about perception. Then we have discrete moments of experience. And finally, qualia formalism, which is something that we do a lot at uh, Qualia Research Institute is try to basically find formalisms of different phenomena. Okay, so first of all, indirect realism about perception. Uh, these pictures are from cognitive scientist uh, Stephen Lehar, who has a, quite a fascinating book about um, basically how, to a large extent, the, the brain is generating a real-time world simulation of our environment. And that, in a sense, you never actually perceive the world directly. You're kind of um, within this, you know, reality bubble that is inside your brain. And there's all sorts of tricks that are going on in order for you to experience it as if you were perceiving the world directly. A lot of those involve, for example, projective geometry, so that you can, in a sense, represent the horizon, kind of these points at infinity. You get the feeling that you can in a sense, kind of peer into those very, very far away places, even though in some sense, even the furthest point in your experience is still contained within your brain. So there's kind of this projective trick for you to kind of perceive infinity within a confined space. Um, and what these kind of indirect realism about perception uh, view and account of experience would suggest as well is that not only space has kind of these tricks for you to kind of uh, navigate the world, but perhaps also your experience of time. There's kind of these interesting tricks on time perception for you to really feel embedded in space time. Uh, the second assumption uh, that I think is very important is this notion of discrete moments of experience that basically um, for moment to moment, it's not actually kind of a continuous experience that is going on but rather that we are kind of a collection of movie frames. Now, each movie frame itself contains the feeling of the passage of time of the very recent past and some predictions about what's going to, to happen in the future. But in a sense, the, the view here is that you can actually fundamentally break down um, that stream of consciousness into literal kind of snapshots or, or segments. And each of those segments would be a individual experience. And in a sense, you know, we don't know how many experiences there are in, for example, for example a second. Uh, there could be like 10 experiences or there could be a billion. We don't, we don't really know. But the, the assumption is basically that, yes, it's uh, discretized. There's going to be like kind of these flashes of coherence in the nervous system. And when you're aware of something, you're one of those flashes, in a sense. Uh, and the picture here is of the, the Hogan sisters who share a thalamus. What the kind of discrete moments of experience assumption here would say is that either they are experiencing two different streams of consciousness, in a sense, maybe they share some of the content, but uh, they're still kind of separate uh, observers, or they're actually one observer with perhaps like two voices, two internal monologues. But you know, it's possible. I mean, if you have schizophrenia, you can be a one observer, but with multiple uh, narratives kind of uh, trying to take over the, the mental situation. So there's kind of a lot of um, possibilities here, but the assumption basically would say that there's only the option of two experiences or one experience. What cannot be possible is kind of this weird in-between of something uh, belonging to multiple experiences at once. Uh, so it's, it's discrete. You can actually uh, segment it out. Um, and in a sense, like the, the main kind of um, mathematical uh, underpinning here would be this concept of topological segmentation. That like whenever you have a moment of experience, you're, you're like literally segmenting out part of the physical universe that becomes kind of its own pocket. <laughs> and you are one of those pockets at every point in time. 
Um, and uh, yeah, you can get this phenomena in, in many, many different ways. But basically, topological segmentation happens in, in physics in many conditions. It might happen also in, in the brain in order to generate moments of experience. Um, and finally, uh, Quilia formalism. This is the notion that uh, an experience is actually uh, underneath it all, you can understand it as a mathematical object. And this is very related to tech marks, uh, kind of multiverse level four in the sense of like everything uh, fundamentally can be modeled in terms of um, uh, mathematical objects. And in, in here, a moment of experience would be, uh, wouldn't be an exception. It would be, it would be the same. So uh, there's definitely an open question of like where in math you may find uh, consciousness, but uh, we think it's not a nonsensical question to ask. Uh, and if you kind of like map out the hierarchy of possible mathematical objects somewhere there, there's gonna be a, a subset that will neatly capture all the features of consciousness. And what we wanna do with these assumptions in a sense is to model the experience of time, phenomenal time, by identifying a mathematical feature within a formalism that captures the properties of the, the experience of time. And uh, this sounds like a, a huge mouthful or an impossible task, but I'll, I'll show you that like you can actually get pretty far with a very simple model. And that simple model basically is going to be a graph model of, of what happens in experience. So uh, in this model, basically you, ex you describe a moment of experience as a graph where each of the nodes is kind of a very basic quail. It could be, for example, the, the feeling of the color blue, a tiny speck of blue. Uh, it could also be like a, a tiny hint of, let's say, the, the smell of cinnamon or, you know, uh, a particular uh, pure tone. And that then there's these edges that basically connect these more basic quails to form uh, kind of a whole experiences. So when you open your eyes and you, you see a visual field, that visual field would be kind of built up from the bottom up with lots and lots of kind of little pixels. But then those pixels would be related in complex and interesting ways such that you end up generating the world simulation that you inhabit. Um, in practice, I think like this would be a very, very complicated graph um, that like on a given moment of experience, in a sense, you're tracking down a lot of nodes, a lot of like micro experiences that happened like several seconds ago, they're still kind of lingering. And how you stitch together uh, the feeling of the present moment in a sense is by putting together all of these different nodes um, uh, of hints of sensory input that happened over the last several seconds and creating these, yeah, basically this graph with kind of a, a trail of what has been happening recently. Um, and more so like there would be clusters in this graph. Uh, and for example, a full phenomenal object, like looking at a hand, in a sense, you, if, if your visual system is working properly, you will be segmenting out that hand from its um, background. So you, there's kind of this figure ground decomposition fundamentally would be grounded on very, very heavy clustering within the graph. That basically the things that are very, very connected to each other, they would feel very close within your experience. And the more detail you add to an experience, the more uh, clustered it becomes. Um, now, let's go kind of like into what is it that we have to explain? Because, you know, as I, I was kind of explaining that like, you can break down the normal passage of time as kind of these graph with like nodes that kind of like under, um, that continue to survive from several seconds ago but there's a lot more to explain, right? Like the, the normal experience of time is just one corner case of everything that you can experience. So what I'm gonna walk you through now is basically the different types of exotic phenomenal times that there are. And um, just uh, as an example, somebody trying uh, Salvinorin B, uh, which is a, um, a, a, a derivative of uh, Salvia, Salvinorin A, and uh, I mean, the, the quote is something about like, hey, it was completely atemporal, you know, the things like memories and dreams and fears that usually define what a human experience is are gone when you don't have time. <laughs> and in a sense, it's a profound type of ego death, but it's still an experience, you know, and you have to understand and model it as an experience 
even though it lacks most of the normal human qualities. So um, the thing to, to explain is going to be, in a sense, uh, the whole category of what we call exotic phenomenal time. You know, like how there can be exotic particles or exotic space in physics. Likewise, in psychology, we can think of there being exotic experiences. Corner cases and weird configurations may not be common, but you know, they have to be explained by a full theory. Um, the very first one is time expansion. Uh, this is you know, super common on psychedelics or, or weed or meditation uh, or sensory deprivation tanks. And kind of like how this manifests is that you experience um, what, uh, uh, for example, Heidegger um, might have called the spacious present, kind of this expanded notion of the present, that the, the present contains more information about what has been happening for more seconds in the past. And perhaps also it carries predictions further into the future. So it kind of feels that you have a expanded notion of time. Uh, and, you know, I think like it makes a lot of sense that psychedelics would do this because to a large extent, you can explain a lot of psychedelic effects in terms of uh, basically tracing. Uh, what I would also describe as kind of a longer, de uh, longer uh, curve for the decay of qualia. So basically the, the decay of qualia over time becomes kind of fatter, things last for longer. So if you move your hand around, um, kind of the, the garbage collector <laughs> of your experience is not working very well. So there's like a lot of kind of like copies of your hand that will be lingering for longer. But uh, I'm not the first one to point out that this is not just a visual effect. That like these like psychedelic tracers happen on also touch and also emotions and thought. And it's very common for you to, for example, be in a room and move to another room and still kind of feel you're in the previous room. Basically, everything lasts longer. The garbage collector uh, kind of fails to clear out a whole lot of things across the board. And in this sense, you know, if you're made of a graph, now the graph is going to be elongated. You have a more spacious present. Um, and uh, I mean, this, I think, is like pretty, pretty extreme, for example, in cases like uh, DMT, because DMT tends to have this very, very high vibration uh, property to it that basically creates a lot of kind of like snapshots of your experience and overlays them on top of each other. So you get almost kind of these, I mean, what a lot of people might describe as almost kind of a four dimensional effect where uh, a lot of experiences kind of start stacking on top of each other um, and, and you become kind of this four dimensional cube. It's very, very hard to explain those who have experienced it, they, they'll know what I'm talking about. But it's a, a very kind of a clear case of a time expansion in a very extreme way. Second one is looping. And this is definitely an exotic type of uh, phenomenal time. And it could be described as basically the graph rather than just having one direction in, in its implicit causality as uh, physical time is, is uh, uh, derived from basically networks of, of events. Here, the implicit causality would wrap around in a circle. And it's a very, very startling experience. Most people get uh, kind of frightened the first time this happens to them, or maybe the, <laughs> the tenth time it happens to them. It tends to be a pretty, pretty unsettling experience because you feel that the same thing is happening over and over. And even your attempts to kind of exit the loop uh, end up being part of the loop itself. And <laughs> that's, that can be extremely unsettling for, for a lot of people. Um, but also, if you know, hey, this is a phenomenon that can happen um, and you're prepared for it, you know, you can actually instantiate this sort of uh, exotic time and be okay with it. I mean, the, the freaking out about it is not a, an intrinsic feature of it. I think that's just a normal human response to something so exotic. Um, but uh, yeah, it's possible to trigger this, this feeling with, for example, extremely repetitive music and stroboscopic stimulation in conjunction with, for example, deep meditation or, or psychedelics. Uh, either of those is likely to actually generate this, this, um, this effect. It's one of the most common among, among the, the exotic phenomenal time. Um, 
And these are like some examples of like what looping may feel like. There is uh, to the lower left, uh, perhaps a super simple loop, uh, as well as to the bottom, uh, to the top, top right. And then to the bottom right, it's these much more complex, uh, what in dynamic systems is called a, a limit cycle. Just basically how that picture was generated was by having um, a camera basically uh, looking at the, the screen uh, of its broadcast and basically tweaked uh, in its angle a little bit and with uh, uh, some, some visual effects such that um, you end up having kind of this uh, these, uh, emergent uh, cycle that actually just never ends. It just continues on and on. And it's pretty fascinating that it even repeats at all, given how complex it is. Uh, but a lot of like loops, uh, people who complain of getting stuck <laughs> in, in a psychedelic experience, they may be having like very complex loops. It doesn't have to be a, a simple loop. Um, it, it, it happens in all, all kinds of ways. Um, and also they actually can feel pretty, pretty cosmic and, and significant because there's this, almost this feeling of eternal life that like, just because the whole thing is repeating, entropy doesn't increase. It feels like it's uh, happening endlessly. Of course, you know, from a truly physical point of view, you're still increasing entropy. It's just that in the pocket of reality where you are, perhaps entropy is not changing very much. Um, but yeah, it, it's a very startling feeling for, for that reason. Um, and that's just, yeah, another example of a possible looping. Okay, so now moments of eternity. The, the first quote uh, that I shared actually kind of describes uh, this uh, phenomenon. And that's, uh, yeah, basically where time stops, which is very different than when time loops. Um, when time stops, it's, there's this feeling that uh, somebody I interviewed who experienced this, they, uh, they describe it as the cause becomes the same as the effect. So it's almost kind of the, the operation of paying attention to your experience literally generates the same experience you were paying attention to in the first place. So basically nothing changes. Everything is kind of stuck. It um, happens also in, in, in meditation and potentially Samadhi or feelings of enlightenment may also be related to uh, moments of eternity. Um, and one way you can de describe it in terms of dynamic system is with this concept of a fixed point. That again, if you have a camera looking at its uh, own feed, a lot of the things that happen in that configuration will be chaotic and unstable. But some angles and some zooms will basically create um, a shape that is perfectly self repeating. And when you have that, uh, basically, you get stuck in time. <laughs> Things don't evolve anymore. Uh, and this is an example of that. Those are uh, two fixed points. You first have kind of this cross fixed point because the camera is presumably uh, rotated 90 degrees, so it feeds uh, the same thing. But if you disturb it enough, you can collapse it into another fixed point. So perhaps when you're in a moment of eternity, you may go to other moments of eternity and every time you switch, it feels like you teleported to it because time, time broke down in between. Uh, and this uh, GIF kind of uh, illustrates a little bit what I'm talking about here, that maybe you may transition from one moment of eternity to another, but each of those is, uh, doesn't, time doesn't pass. So it's also a very strange experience to, to move one from another. Um, and then we have uh, looping. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I just wanted to give you the feeling of what uh, uh, looping feels like, <laughs> which is <laughs> when, when the, the thing is happening again and you don't know why. But uh, okay, so <laughs> moving on, time reversal. Um, this is uh, actually very rare, but it still happens, uh, especially high doses of psychedelics where people report seeing something happen, for example, like a cup uh, full of water falling off a table uh, breaking into pieces and then the pieces reassembling and then the cup getting back on the table. Um, I mean, of course, you know, people would be divided about like, hey, whether you actually travel in time or not. Uh, I think like the, the more likely scenario is that you made some very heavy predictions, you hallucinated the predictions, and then given the absence of feedback for those predictions, your brain, in a sense, reverted those predictions. But I mean, regardless of how it was actually generated, it's a very, very strange feeling of basically things um, kind of like erasing their own trajectory, moving backwards in time, reducing entropy. Um, and uh, for example, the one in the left, 
has kind of a sure forward and backwards in time. But yeah, one of the things on uh, backwards in time is that, in a sense, if, if uh, normally on a psychedelic you experience tracers, kind of the, the hand leaving multiple copies, in a time reversal, exotic time, the copies will be basically swallowing the tracer as it moves. Um, so in a sense, you're erasing the paths. It's a very, very strange experience. And uh, yeah, uh, very rare, but it absolutely happens. Um, and uh, yeah, we're getting close to the end. Uh, the, the fifth one is time branching. Um, this one is, for example, somebody is um, uh, sitting in a couch, they stand up and it looks like they're going to the bathroom. And then you actually see the person kind of split into two paths. One of them goes to the bathroom, the other goes to the kitchen. And then you see perhaps the person in the kitchen also split again, one, you know, picking up some, a beer and another one picking up some chips or something like that. And, uh, you know, it's very unsettling as well because if you're experiencing that, you don't know in which branch you are. You're basically, you can, it's kind of like you feel outside time and things are kind of branching in the quantum multiverse or something like that. The one way in which you perhaps can explain this is as your brain is generating predictions of what is going to happen next. And because you're in the psychedelic state, it's failing to erase those predictions. And I, I suspect that's actually what is going on, but it still feels like you're seeing kind of like everything that could happen at once. Um, I think like, yeah, this is a, an example quote of, of this and uh, um, how, yeah, basically people experience like those dozens of timelines all happening at once and they're very scared because they don't know to which one they, they actually belong. Um, and uh, the really crazy thing is that, in a sense, you can actually test whether this, this is true or not, whether it's a hallucination or whether you're actually experiencing multiple branches. And uh, I actually conducted this test. So what I did was I made this uh, little browser app where basically there are three dots, uh, and they start at the top, and they move at a constant speed downwards, where the horizontal speed a movement is uh, random. So basically it's kind of a random walk in the horizontal direction. And two of those are basically coming from a random, uh, classical random number generator uh, set at the beginning of the trial. And one of them is basically the randomness coming from a live quantum random number generator. And what we see if we do this, um, would be, you know, if you can actually experience the time branching and it's a real phenomena, you know, you see different branches of the multiverse or something like that, you should be able to tell which of these three dots is the quantum random number one generated because uh, basically one of those would kind of like start branching. Um, you see this, this, in this example, the, the one in the center would be the quantum random number generator one because its path is uh, undetermined when you start the trial. Now, uh, then if the effect was actually true, you should be able to perform better than chance at selecting which one is the correct one. Now, uh, some anonymous uh, trippers actually um, contacted me and they performed the experiment on, I believe, LSD, 2CB, and DMT at uh, different times. And, um, I've got to say the report is that they perform just as well as chance. So, <laughs> so don't worry. I don't think this is a, you know, you're not actually breaking kind of the laws of physics and seeing the universe branch, um, at least not in this sample. Uh, that said, it's true that like, even though they, they took substantial doses and, and all that, uh, they didn't report time branching on that particular effect. So to actually conduct this experiment to kind of a satisfactory level, I would say, we would probably need people for whom the effect happens reliably and then give the, the experiment to them. And I think that would be uh, quite interesting. But yeah, so far the evidence suggests that this is all, all in your head as, <laughs> as uh, of course, one should, uh, one should anticipate from the beginning. Um, and yeah, uh, from um, uh, the subreddit Bitcoin markets, for some reason, here's probably one of the <laughs> craziest uh, examples of, uh, of uh, uh, time branching, which is, yeah, it was, it was as if uh, thousands of versions of me was experiencing this moment. 
you know, it is hard to explain, but in every situation where something could happen, both things happened and I experienced both timelines uh, simultaneously. So yeah, I mean, this is apparently a relatively common uh, or like much more common than you would imagine. I mean, it's still fairly rare, but um, uh, the internet has a whole lot of uh, examples of this of these happening. Um, and yeah, I mean, in, in a super extreme example, if you have time branching to, to an extreme degree, you end up having kind of this uh, fractalization. Uh, also, I mean, most likely if you're experiencing this is profound ego death, you really don't know where you are, but it feels like you're spanning the entire multiverse and it's super, super, super strange. And again, my understanding here would be, well, you know, your, your pseudo time arrow is experiencing this branching factor that is leading to this kind of tree-like structure. And of course, you know, by the moment you, you are a tree time-like structure, um, you're not really human in any, in any recognizable sense. You're like this completely exotic, you know, almost something worthwhile to put in a, in a museum, given just how strange it is. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, all of this is uh, possible. It happens to people and uh, people get really confused about all of these weird effects. Uh, and I think, yeah, this is the last one, time convergence, or next to the last one. Uh, this one is the opposite or the inverse of time branching. So rather than like time kind of uh, splitting into many timelines, uh, what you end up happening here is um, time kind of converging, multiple timelines converging into just one point. Um, and uh, that, yeah, also very strange. Uh, and a lot of people might describe it as kind of, you get into the, um, the computer room of the universe. I mean, it, a lot of like simulationist uh, experiences on DMT, I think can actually just be understood as time convergence, that you're like tracking many multiple timelines and through some kind of annealing process, you converge into just one big timeline. And it's super trippy. Um, I don't think there's anything supernatural to it, but it's absolutely something that people do experience and it's very strange. Um, and finally, timelessness. This is when basically uh, the, the network is, is very scrambled and so scrambled that there's actually no more uh, possible arrow of causality in it. Uh, and when you have that, uh, basically time, is not, not that time stops, but rather that time is meaningless, that there's just no time. Similar to like if you scramble a, uh, a uh, geometric network too much, all of a sudden it's just not a geometric network anymore. It's just a network. It doesn't have a geometry. And likewise, if you scramble too much, you know, the graph that makes up your, your own consciousness, you end up in this thing that is, it's not that time has stopped, it's just that there's no time and there's no notion of space. And uh, my understanding is that high doses of ketamine, for example, especially at the very beginning, basically on the come up, of dissociatives, uh, you're likely to experience a lot of uh, timelessness, uh, this profoundly strange confusion because you, you can't really track time or space, uh, which is different than perhaps what happens later on a ketamine session where you may experience uh, something like moments of eternity or looping or some of the other ones. But yeah, this would be kind of the, the beginning with, when things are um, basically uh, atomizing or powderizing, everything is uh, getting scrambled. Um, and in terms of dynamic systems, uh, how you might generate a, a sense of atemporality is basically with um, playing with uh, turbulence, basically configurations of feedback systems that not only in a sense um, produce chaotic structures, but actually produce truly random structures that are as close to white noise as possible. And when you hit white noise, then yes, that's an atemporal experience. Time is meaningless in, in those, those states. Um, and uh, I will end by kind of like speculating. You know, I just walked you through like seven different types of exotic phenomenal time. But if indeed experience can be explained uh, in terms of a graph, then there's so many other exotic phenomenal times we could construct, especially if you consider the space of possible hybrid phenomenal times where some region in the network might be looping, some other region might be in a moment of eternity and perhaps another region is branching. And you know, if you have a very 
big experience, um, there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to segment different regions of it for different types of phenomenal time. Um, not unlike perhaps um, how we think of something like Feynman diagrams that like, hey, this part over here is moving forwards in time. This part in here is doing a loop. This part in here is branching. Uh, I think a lot of kind of the, the topologies we see in here, we could in a sense use to recreate completely new exotic phenomenal times. Now, of course, just because you predict, you know, a phenomenal time is possible, doesn't mean you know how to generate it. And, you know, that's a completely open problem. <laughs> how do you generate an arbitrary phenomenal time? But uh, my suspicion is that when we understand consciousness much better, we will be able to inhabit, you know, any phenomenal time we want. It's just a matter of figuring out how to engineer it and, and induce it um, with brain computer interfaces. Um, and yeah, I think I would kind of end with this cheesy quote of, you know, be the time you want to see in the world. I mean, some, <laughs> some phenomenal times are more fun and interesting than others. And, and I think that's, uh, I think that's it. Uh, I think that's uh, the end of the presentation. And I'll open up uh, for questions. And uh, uh, yeah, follow whatever <laughs> you guys want to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was yes. fantastic. I, oh, wow. I, I really enjoyed this. I'm glad to be back. Thank you for taking the lead and kickstarting the presentation. <laughs> um, yes. OK, uh, that was quite a mouthful. I just shared your original article with many of you. Um, and yeah, I think we can just open it up to a presentation, uh, to, to questions and you just take them uh, as you see them. I think we're only 24 people. So perhaps people who have a question can just chime in. That may be easiest. Yeah. Hi, Andre. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I have a large question, a kind of macro question, and that is I'd like to ask you to speculate on the relationship of four areas in trying to figure this out that goes beyond just the mathematical model. And the first is, what is the nature and structure of the brain and how that limits or provides a context for the nature of language itself? And then additionally, cultural narratives and the, that structure within which all of these narratives are created, including the mathematical one. So I guess I'm just interested in, have you thought about how some of these other areas tie in in terms of either context or limitations or inclusion? Yeah, that's such a, such a big question. Um, I mean, I think I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll start by saying, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think definitely the structure of the brain constrains a lot uh, how, phenomenal time arises, and definitely also how language is produced. What, some of the uh, effects of the psychedelic uh, thing, like probably the simplest one is the, the tracing. Uh, the tracing, I think it's actually a very big reflection of a lot of the structure in the brain. Uh, for example, the thalamocortical loop, between, like basically between the visual cortex and the thalamus, uh, some evidence suggests that the mechanism of action of psychedelics is by breaking or interrupting uh, an inhibitory signal from the visual cortex into the thalamus, such that uh, basically you prevent the inhibition of what you just experienced a second ago. So you end up having kind of these lingering sensations. Um, as I was kind of describing, the garbage collector <laughs> of experience is uh, kind of impaired, it's, it's not there anymore. Um, and I think like, yeah, like how we construct language or thought forms have a whole lot to do with uh, kind of the looping structure of our experience. That the fact that we can uh, construct thoughts in a serial or sequential way has to do with the fact that you can kind of have a thought and then 200 milliseconds, you kind of experience an echo of that thought. And by experiencing an echo of that thought, you can build on top of it. So I, I would tend to think a lot of language is really built on top of this looping structure of basically re-experiencing slightly what you just experienced 200 or 400 milliseconds ago. Um, I'm not aware, uh, to be honest, of like differences in culture for how people experience time, but I'm, I suspect there's probably some substantial differences. I mean, 
similar as to how different cultures partition the, the, the color wheel slightly differently, or they might emphasize some differences more than others. I would suspect, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I was born and raised in, in Mexico and it's quite a terrible stereotype, but like we Mexicans are not necessarily the most uh, on time to, to things sometimes. Um, at, <laughs> and, and you perhaps might think of like the cultural construction of, for example, what uh, an event is. That like, hey, if they, they, um, if they say it starts at four, actually what they mean is that it really starts at six and you should be arriving better around like maybe five or so and i suspect there's probably cultural differences in how yeah the that sense of time is constructed but i'm i'm not and i don't know primary research on it but excellent question <laughs> thank you so um is there a uh, uh any connection between the eeg brain waves and the perception of time in the brain? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, definitely something really cool that's been going on in the literature nowadays when it comes to understanding altered states uh, and psychedelics is this notion of signal complexity, that basically when you're in a heightened state of consciousness, the basically brain waves are less easy to compress, meaning that the uh, amount of and variety of signals is much broader. There is a more, uh, what they call, uh, signal diversity going on. And in a sense that it would be very related to kind of this notion of, of branching, because if you have a high level of signal diversity, it sort of indicates that more possible brain waves are in a sense able to interact with one another. So rather than kind of having this more simple linear progression, there's most the possibility of uh, basically branching, as well as a wider repertoire of brain states. That's another uh, concept coming from um, uh, cell and atosoids work on connecting specific harmonic waves. But basically what they identified was that on, on LSD, you experience a broader range of possible combinations of connecting harmonics. Basically the brain can resonate in more ways and more of those ways can interact with each other on a psychedelic. Um, yes. Something? Well, I mean, the, the alpha state, for example, is a lower frequency state than the typical uh, conscious thought states, uh, but it is often associated with meditative thought and that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm not sure that matches what you just said, but... No, sure. So alpha, um, to, yeah, to, talk, to mention that, so definitely there's like a lot of studies that indicate that, for example, mindfulness can help people at will increase alpha power. But um, the more trippy or the more kind of mind expanding properties of meditation and psychedelics are more associated with gamma frequencies, basically the much higher frequencies, um, as well as with like signal diversity. And signal diversity can happen across the frequency spectrum. I mean, you can have like more signal diversity in alpha. It's just that the complexity of that signal is, is higher. And uh, uh, may I say something? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, this is Creon here. Yeah, I want to just chime in and say, first of all, the whole alpha, beta, gamma, delta thing is kind of 1960s level um, uh, EEG stuff. And it's got moved way, way beyond that now. Um, and what he's talking about with signal diversity, I also would like to put in a uh, little something about that. It, it's actually not the compressibility, as I understand which is the real issue here, because you can have completely random firings of all neurons and that would be, you know, uh, maximally uncompressible, but that's not any sort of sophisticated brain state, right? It turns out, as far as I know, uh, from just from reading, uh, you know, papers on this, that, that the important thing is which, there's, there's this uh, thing called self-organized criticality, and it looks like what the human brain does is it usually tries to sit kind of right on the edge of, chaos so it's not too predictable and it's not too random and exactly how you ride that how the brains uh connectome harmonics and things like that rides that edge is is really critical so if you're in a sort of um ruminating state where the default mode network is highly active then you're um you're sort of down away from the critical threshold or the turbulent threshold, if you will. And if you're in a bit more of a psychedelic state, a meditative state, a state of an infant 
or even a state of an animal, um, you know, more, more kind of present in the moment, then um, you're closer to the, um, to the uh, uh, critical threshold. And, um, you know, we're just starting to learn about this stuff. But like, again, it's the connect home harmonics, it's not just that like the more harmonics you have, the more sophisticated your brain state is, or the more um, psychedelic it is. It's we're just starting to decode the details of the structures in space and time of these firing patterns. You know, it's like, it's, it, we're just starting. I mean, we're so far from understanding this stuff, but it's really tantalizing. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with what, what uh, Korean said. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, like, they did an interesting study where an uh, econ professor was in China and he was going over F.A. Hayek's Road to Serfdom. And oftentimes his students got in a really big argument about if they thought the problem of socialism was because uh, decentralization was the answer or was actually because they needed more effective centralization. And I think it's one of those things where, like, depending on your cultural uh, background, if you're from a collectivist or individualistic side, like it ends up shaping your brain and how you actually form thoughts and ideas. Do you think different cultures are more receptive to uh, some psychedelic experiences or some might actually be by uh, the way they grew up, they might actually have a negative experience from it? Oh, that's, <laughs> I don't know, fa fascinating question. My my sense is that, uh, I mean, with psychedelics, you can both, I think, increase individualism or collectivism. So my sense is that any culture can figure out a way to use them for, <laughs> for their own purposes, whatever they may be. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, I, I, like, just a, just a kind of like fun, quick example is that I think psychedelics are traditionally associated with just increased individuality, uh, at least in the sense of like, hey, like rebelling from mainstream culture and so on. But then if you look at, you know, uh, a group of hippies or, or, uh, or you know, bur burners actually having a psychedelic experience, they have kind of usually this, you know, collective group ego death and they chant and they, they really look like a unified organism, right? So it's kind of, I think it really goes both ways. You could have a collectivist uh, society that could potentially use psychedelics in, in a way to enhance that collectivism, I, as you know no bar barrier to doing that. Uh, one thing uh, that, uh, j just just to, to back on top of it, um, I think in uh, Behave, in Robert Sapolsky's uh, book, he kind of like lies out that collectivist cultures are a little bit better at um, distinguishing, uh, if, they, if they have to look at an image, at distinguishing relational properties in an image rather than uh, at like what individuals are doing or something. So if, if that's true, then, you know, maybe that relational uh, part is, is, is perhaps naturally enhanced if they're better at distinguishing that in images. So may, you could speculate that uh, when they're having a trip, they're better to kind of like um, also see like relational aspects uh, and things and, and, and have even different hallucinations. I don't know. This is a total speculation. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe to, to build on top of that even further. So with a generalized tracer effect, uh, again, that it happens visually, but also with everything else. I think, uh, I mean, I'm not the first to point out that like this also happens with the, f the cognition over human relationships. And this is very strange to think about, but like uh, in a sense, in your brain, you don't only have, let's say, a representation of who different people are in your life. You also have a representation of what your relationship to them is that has a certain qualia to it. And uh, if you think of, for example, autism, autism to a large extent causes problems in representing the relationship between people who are not you. So basically you may be representing your relationship with A and with B, but not the relationship of A and B together. But on a psychedelic, if you actually kind of think of first your relationship with A and then with the relationship with B, because they will both linger for longer, you're kind of forced to actually kind of consider the relationship between A and B as well. So I would generally say that on a psychedelic, the complexity, the maximum complexity of the possible relationship qualia you can have increases dramatically. So you can think of all of the relationships in, in a group more easily at once rather than just, you know, each individual separately, which I think like would point to, yeah, generally 
uh, the possibility of creating it as a social technology. I think of all of these uh, phenomenal time effects, uh, the, the one that's of most interest to me is, it, is the time compression uh, because it pretends a world where you're able to do more uh, with less. I'm thinking of a dream state uh, where, wherein um, uh, you have a dream that it seems that you've just experienced a year, but that's, uh, that's a sort of cinematic trick uh, where um, uh, it, the, the dream was artfully composed in such a way that you're, um, you still, it was still only 15 minutes or something. You know, like the movie is, it seems to take a place over a decade, but it's still only 90 minutes long. Um, I mean, what, what do you think about this idea of actually um, being able to make use of time compression um, in, uh, in, in, in our time? No, I think it's uh, fantastic. And I think uh, that is the way to go in the long, in the long run. Um, there is this notion where, I mean, I, I strongly suspect that we will need to, uh, basically, I mean, transhumanists and posthumans are not only going to experience more intelligence, live longer, uh, feel happier, I think they will also experience more consciousness as a whole, that basically they will be not only super happy, but super sentient. And I think like the best example I know of, of something that dramatically causes time expansion and space expansion and expansion of consciousness um, is 5-MeO DMT. I mean, if I were to point at like one substance that I would say, uh, points exactly in the direction you're talking about, about like massively expanding the feeling of time and space and living longer within the span of five minutes, it would be what happens when you take a substantial dose of 5-MeO DMT. I mean, people say like, you know, eternity happens <laughs> within those five minutes. And um, yeah, basically you become like 10 times more conscious or something insane like that. I, I mean, how it happens. <laughs> Completely, I don't think science has any idea right now how 5-MeO DMT works, but it would be the way to go to research the possibility of living longer within the same time of the span of time. So, oh, thank you. I have a, sorry. I was going to ask, um, the, the, the overall theory is the idea that modifying the graph and, and change, how that represents what's going on in our heads um, changes our experience. What degree, do you know anything about, is, is there any study done, any information about what degree um, the, like the position or movement that you're doing with, the, with your body affects that graph in these ways? Right. Um, no, I don't think there's any direct research on that. I would say, though, that uh, several like, psychedelic practitioners, like underground practitioners, and at least one, one guy called uh, Martin Ball, Martin Ball, who uses 5-MeO DMT, um, he talks a lot about like the importance of like symmetry in the body. Um, and part of it, and I, I think like there's quite, actually quite a bit uh, to be said about it, which is that, um, and related to what Crayon was, was saying, that basically the, the information content of your experience, you can think of it as kind of the symmetry breaking operations that are present. So if you're in a psychedelic trip, and you want to regain your ego, so to speak, actually doing like very asymmetric shapes may help because it puts, it kind of like stores these <laughs> pieces of information on top of which you can reconstruct your ego. Whereas if you stay perfectly bilaterally symmetrical, there's just no place where to store that information. So ego death is more likely and time expansion is more likely. So <laughs> Uh, I haven't verified these, but I've, I've seen a bunch of reports of people saying something like that happens. So for oh, maxi for, that, for, that, for, that, for, sorry, okay. for, for maximum therapeutic effects, stay as symmetrical as possible for as long as possible would be the advice. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, <laughs> okay. uh, the more therapeutic experiences have definitely been um, sedentary, <laughs> lying down in a place where it's easy to maintain symmetry. And, uh, vague recollections you know it always felt more comfortable to be symmetric just because it's more comfortable to lay down symmetrically but um never occurred to me that that, that might also yeah wow neat <laughs> <laughs> um i have a question that is kind of also piggybacking on that which is um 
you know, given the fact that uh, if, if we can already distinguish different types of um, kind of like time perception, even like within humans, uh, what if any implications would that have uh, for AIs and other minds that we may be creating? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Age of M by Robin Hansen and, you know, he's just basically doing a, an, an, an economic assessment of what that would mean for the economy if we could suddenly create emulations of, of our mind that uh, could run at speeds that are vastly incomprehensible to us. Uh, and I was wondering whether uh, whether you were looking at all into kind of like different, uh, what different mind architectures may perceive uh, uh, that, that we're building and, and how that relates uh, to what you just talked about. Uh, fantastic question. I mean, I think, I think there's a, quite a bit more to, to be said there. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I think like different phenomenal times will be kind of computationally optimal for different tasks. And I mean, I think like, yeah, for office work, perhaps the, <laughs> the normal human everyday uh, time is probably optimal or perhaps, you know, the amphetamine time, <laughs> like slightly, slightly upped, but still just not, not a, an insane or completely bizarre uh, state of consciousness. But I, I, I mean, I do think that some of the hardest computational problems actually do require kind of this very unusual time expansion or or exotic time, like time loops and things like that. The, the thing is, is kind of like, I suspect those are kind of computational super weapons in a sense that you could actually use for insanely powerful optimization problems. The thing is that we don't know what, what to point it at. You would, it's kind of like you have this massive supercomputer, but you just don't know what it's good for. <laughs> and I think it's, it's, it's kind of like we will, in a sense, um, the analogy here would be, for example, how I believe, uh, um, yeah, when electricity was uh, being discovered, at first it was just for, for playthings, right? It was like, oh, you, you go to a, a party and they show like this amazing, you know, like Tesla coil or something really fun. But then people ask like, what, what is that is useful for? It's like, well, um, eventually, you know, it's even taxed and just like it's considered a human right. And likewise, I think like exotic phenomenal time Right now, we just don't know what it's useful for, but I suspect it has very powerful computational properties. Thank you. Even, even a small degree of the effects uh, that you're describing, you alluded to super uh, sentience or was alluded to um, th these kinds of brain computer interfaces that would allow this sort of thing to occur, but also allow a kind of uh, collectivism that no one has ever experienced uh, here before. Um, a small, a small degree of those effects uh, could al allow, I mean, allow for like the people in this room uh, to do things that no concern or institution could accomplish right now, like getting off world, like operating in conjunction. It's an incredible amount of work product that could be generated from these things in coming years. Andre, is it, do I understand it correctly? Uh, I was a little bit late, maybe five, 10 minutes that uh, this research, what you are doing, it basically it creates the foundations of the user experience in future scenarios when the brain computer interfaces finally get commercialized, right? So Brad was asking about EEG, ju just to observe these things that we are describing here, uh, different time dimensions, how can we handle it? Uh, but do you think when uh, the existing uh, research and commercial deployments by neural links and, and uh, open water, so they, it, it seems to me they, they are going to reach some breakthroughs here. So, and it's not clear, how can we efficiently use our upgrades, right, in, in the cloud, uh, what would be the real user inter? What would be the user experience, right? So it's sometimes even the user experience with with the with, with the smartphone sometimes is too disruptive because it's uh, our DNA is not programmed to to this kind of um, uh, this kind of uh, uh, perception of of what's going on in the machine. Now what you are describing, it's 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 yeah, as you said, you it, you can just imagine it as as if you were under uh, the influence of some sort of drugs, right? 
So it's, is it is it correct to assume that somehow this will lead to a new uh, user experience uh, being connected to computers? <laughs> I think so. I think so. That would that. I mean, I think that's definitely the forward forward looking application here. That, for example, you may want to create uh, games where the standard phenomenal time in those games is, for example, time looping. And, <laughs> and maybe you interchange information in a time looping way. And it would be, yeah, very different experience than accelerated time or timelessness. Um, but I think like we don't even need to wait for like Neuralink or um, like all these technologies to become commercialized to actually make use of exotic phenomenal times. Because once you know that basically there's this simple model of a graph and the implicit causality in that graph that determines the flow of time. Um, and I've, I've received reports from people who read the article and then have taken like, let's say LSD and meditated on a particular exotic phenomenal time. And they report that now they can actually induce it on purpose. So like you can, like it's, it's usually would be by accident. It's like, oh, you took LSD at a festival and you, happen to experience a time loop and it's very strange and, and you're surprised. Um, but here is like, hey, somebody takes LSD in an optimal set and setting with the purpose of creating and experiencing exotic phenomenal times. And apparently it works. You can actually do it. <laughs> All right. Hey, Andres, I cannot thank you enough. I think you've really blown some minds here. <laughs> um, yeah, people are clapping in their screens and waving and clapping. Thing. Um, thank you so, so much. Thanks again for uh, taking the stage uh, when I dropped off. Uh, it's been really, really fantastic to have you. Uh, the presentation is uh, super stellar. If you could even share maybe the slides so I can yes. put them in, this, in the notes. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And then I will try to get your uh, recording up and running maybe even by tomorrow. In the meantime, for everyone who's still on here, I'm launching a poll. Um, let's see if it can launch if you're getting it then hello, uh, hello. yeah then please yeah. fill out the poll and um, just so that I, I can keep track of um, uh, what foresighters in those uh, channels uh, feel like where they are and where they're from and uh, I shared some information on how to uh, join uh, future foresight salons and on the schedule I will share uh, any information that Anders is willing uh, is willing to to share with me you should totally check out Crowley Research Institute they do insane work uh, they're totally fantastic um, and uh, yeah if you if you want to have your mind boggled all over again then please check out their work uh, I hope to see many of you tomorrow morning here again at 9 a.m pt thank you Andres so so much you totally rock and uh, yeah my mind is blown <laughs> thank you thank you thank you bye everyone see you perhaps tomorrow if you'd like to join again from tomorrow 9 a.m and 6 p.m pt and more information on the schedule. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. <laughs> bye, Andres. Bye, thank you. Everyone, bye. I'm waving if you can't Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> bye. -bye. <laughs> bye. Actually, okay, nice. now it doesn't matter if I break off. Now I'm actually waving. Bye-bye. Okay. Did, did the recording- <laughs> It was lovely to see you. Bye. Did the recording work? Everything worked out perfect, fine. Perfect, perfect. Yes. Excellent. Yes. And I can, I can just yes. close it and yes. it's gonna be fine? <laughs> okay. You can close it. It's going to be fine. Bye. <laughs>